been here before, uh, not exactly this location, but this same situation. Uh, it's Tuesday, it's TED, and we're supposed to be sharing ideas. Um, the last time around, I had 12 minutes to try to explain why in the 21st century of change, it was a bit crazy to act rationally in response to the 20th century. This time, I've got 18 minutes in which to try to explain how you actually survive and thrive in our world after midnight, which changes all the time. I titled my session, Don't Change Anything. I don't know whether you noticed that or not. So you're probably thinking at the back of your mind, oh my goodness, he's just going to do the same talk, but he's just going to do it slower. Okay? <laughs> so, so that's one thought. And the other thought I suspect you've got is also, is it actually possible to learn anything about how you really change in 18 minutes? So with those two thoughts at the back of your mind, I want us to start a process, and hopefully none of those two things will come true. I want to start by just asking you a couple of questions, and the really crucial question is just to check we live in the same complex, fast-changing 21st century. Because I meet people, and sometimes they say to me, no, things are cool, they're always as they've been. But let's just do a quick, quick show of hands. How many people here uh, have started stuff and, and discovered that many of their plans come to nothing? Yeah. Oh, we've got some hands. Okay, how about this one? Uh, you're in an organization, and you have all these ideas, and then you get stuck between the politics and actually getting them done. Oh, wonderful. And then the one I love... It's when you see a new piece of kit, a new piece of technology, and you're really excited. I don't know, the new O-Pod Maxi or something like that, and you chat it to your friends, and just before you find it, you see another cool piece of technology. And you can't... Have you done that one? <laughs> okay, great. Now, the good news about that is we're probably all living in the same world. Uh, why is that important? Because the world which we live in does funny things to us. And I want to try and share with you um, perhaps what is my... my my, my favorite uh, diagram. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll take you around and I hope you recognize some of the elements. It starts over here where it says I have a high workload. Obviously not you guys. You have nothing to do. You're just chilling out at TED all afternoon. Okay. So because I have a high workload, I don't really have time to plan or to do or to be creative. Net result is I don't realize because I haven't planned how much work I'm committed to and I've only done half. Which means I I keep saying yes and cool, that's cool, that's exciting, to more things than it's possible to do. Guess what? Pushing up my workload. Giving me less time to plan or to do anything. So sometimes I come close to deadlines other people think are important. And because, guess, because they're really worried that they'll miss their deadlines or their goals, they come and guess what? They interrupt me. So I spend a lot of my time restarting half-done work, which pushes my workload higher. Giving me less time to plan or to do anything. So all of a sudden, what happens to people know I'm disorganized, they can send me text messages and stuff, and I won't react because I'm disorganized, and it goes around like that. Have you seen that sort of thing? happening to your colleagues at work. <laughs> cool. Isn't it amazing I could know your life when we were just met? <laughs> the reason is because in the complex environment we're in, the important thing to look for is patterns. Patterns persist, events come and go, they evaporate. And so that's really where I want to start. This particular diagram is called the bubble diagram. It's inspired by a chap called Ellie Goldratt. It's really a way of trying to do research really quickly. And I needed that because I decided to set up a virtual business school from scratch, completely crazy man, which meant I had to do research. Normally, you have thousands of research students, clever people, they write papers, they survey people, they publish, and so on. If you're setting up a business school from scratch, you've got to do all the work yourself. And if you really believe the world is changing faster than you can learn, then the other thing you've got to do is you've got to come up with a really fast way of doing research. And that's what the bubble diagrams do, because you look for the patterns. So in this particular pattern, I'm able to understand a lot of things, which means I can go and start di digging into what's underlying it all. What should we really be learning? Well, down here, most people have got goals and targets, which are stretching. I'm sorry, that's just life. However, two other ones which are quite interesting. One of them says, uh, I try to do things the way I always have. If you try and do that, and the world's shifted, guess what? You're going to end up overloaded. And then this one here I, I, I put down here, which I think you should all actually think a little bit about. This one says, many of the things I do have very little effect. Remember? Okay. There's an experiment I did once where I got a group of managers, and I said to them, what we need to do then is we need to get you to look at what you've done in a week. So they kept a spreadsheet for about a week. And I said, keep the spreadsheet, wait four months, and then go through that spreadsheet and tick anything which either made your life better or improved the bottom line. Do you know what the average was? Well, you probably guessed it. It was slightly less than 15%. Maybe not you guys, you actually do something useful. These guys, 15% is less than a day's work a week, and they get full-time salaries. The reason I'm telling you this, of course, <laughs> is because somehow or other we have to approach these things differently. And that's why I set up Pentagon. I had to find ways of doing fast research. And we did that. We were able within a seven-year period to replicate what you do in a normal MBA. 
by simply working hard, but also by using different tools. Innovation is cent central. If you want to innovate, you have to live the innovation and actually use it yourself, not just tell other people about it. The second thing was we had to try and become global to have reach. And this is always a problem. You see, if you're running a normal business school, what happens is you get a couple of really good students, then they go out, they make lots of money, then they die, and then they leave you all the money, and then you can use that money for new buildings and for expansion. You know this particular pattern. Okay, so we didn't have any students who were willing to die for us. So we had no choice. What we had to do is we had to find a way to do it differently. And so way back in the days of things like Netscape and things like that, I started a virtual business school trying to work virtually. And we've built platforms and built platforms. We've got a current platform which we use, which is avatar-based, which is really quite cool. Um, but the whole thing is it allowed me to reach into my clients. So as they were learning and, and changing, I could walk with them. So that's really what I spend my life doing. It's about really trying to shift people's behavior. Now, you might go into the how question. How do we make this thing happen? But before I get to that, I have another thing I have to make sure. You see, one of the big headaches about helping people get better at change is they go away and do it. Now, you might say, why is that a big, big issue? Um, about five years ago, uh, I, I was riding my mountain bike, and I had a shimmy. You know a shimmy? You know what a shimmy is? Basically, you're going along, and the bike gets a life of its own. And I was in France, and I pressed the brake, but I got the wrong one. So I went over the top, and I landed, and I put my arm out, but it didn't work. So I landed on my face, and it did terrible things. Broke my arm, broke my jaw. Those are the interesting bits. Although I must confess, learning to shave with a razor with your left hand is really fascinating. <laughs> but what's really interesting about that was everyone I explained this to, and I explained I'd gone into the accident and hit, landed on my face, um, the first question they asked me was, guess what? Were you wearing a helmet? Why? Because it was deep in their minds. So recently, when there was this discussion about helmet wearing and the impact of helmet wearing on cycle use, I got very interested. And apparently in some parts of the world, it's mandatory, places like uh, Victoria and Australia, it's mandatory to wear a helmet. And once this law came in, the number of people injured through, helmet ac uh, through uh, bicycle accidents went down. So well-meaning people brought this law in. But what they didn't realize, it would have other effects. So for example, one of the effects it had apparently was the kids thought it wasn't cool. So they stopped, wouldn't wear the helmet, so they wouldn't cycle. Are you with me? So the number of people cycling went down. Now, if you think about that, that's cool, but how are the kids getting around? I bet the parents were driving them around, which meant the traffic on the roads went up. Are you with me? And all the time the kids were lying in the back, they were getting tubby. No exercise. What I'm trying to describe is when you kick off change, you have to look into the future. You have to look into the future to understand the impact of what you're going to do. Otherwise, when you succeed, it might be miserable. One of my clients, uh, one of my farmer clients, um, uh, they instituted this really weird thing where they had uh, so like a, 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 a sales force, and they were trying to get the sales force to sell more. Good idea. Okay? So, <laughs> so they said, see more doctors, see more doctors. And they made them see more doctors. And then after a while, they did an audit. And when they looked at the list of doc the doctors they, the people were supposed to be seeing, some of the people, some of the doctors they'd seen, apparently, recently, had been dead for years. Some had moved. What had happened was, somehow or other, they'd kicked off a process, which meant that actually they were seeing fewer real doctors for less time, and the sales are suffering. This is the power of change. You will be able to change. I will help you to think about change. But the crucial thing is you need to look at something other than change. You need to look for what we call improvement. Improvement is that minuscule subset of change where when you go into the future and you look back, you say to yourself, gosh, I'm proud about that. Not only did it make the world better for mankind and all the creatures, but also in terms of my corporate clients, it's also made them richer. You with me? That's what we call improvement. You see the difference? Okay, so. If you're happy to go with improvement, now I can share things with you. This TED Talk has terms and conditions. Therefore, everything you learn from here on must only be used for good. Are you happy? <laughs> Hand on heart, I'll do that, or fingers in the ears. Those are your choices. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. So why doesn't change happen? If you look at the statistics, there are always some great statistics. If you ask people whether change happens or not, they say, yes, I get it right about half the time. If you actually study them, you discover this really fun, funny combination of a sort of a 25 to 50 to 25, where about a quarter of the things people plan to do never start or fail early. A quarter of them actually seem to work quite well. And about half of them, we call them van projects because they suck, suck the living blood out of you, or, or poltergeist projects because they just hang around spooking everyone, smelling bad, making trouble, and not delivering anything. So <laughs> what goes wrong? Well, a number of different things go wrong. The very, very first thing is that we're still in the, the world before midnight mindset. So when people initiate change, they imagine that somehow, when they're starting change, they'll have a clear idea of what they're going to do, the vision, and how they're going to do it, the method. Now, if it was that simple, don't you think someone else would have come up and done it? <laughs> 
It doesn't happen that way. My belief is, in no, less than 9% of the chances, well, ch change chances which we have these days, are you clear on the goal and the method? Most of the time, you've got some idea, you have no idea how to do it. You're feeling a bit challenged and frustrated. You know how you're going to do it, but you're not sure whether anyone wants it and will buy it. Or, my favorite, don't know what to do, <laughs> don't know how to do it, but you've got to do it straight away. <laughs> you got that one? Okay. So it's important to understand that most of the time you'll be dealing with high levels of uncertainty. Now, I know you're all tough people, but I'm going to do a really quick, quick quiz just to see how tough you are. This is crucial because, uh, I'll, I'll do it with you. It's a quick quiz. You're finalists in a game show, okay? This is a, this is a nice little, little exercise. It takes a few seconds. You know, in the old days, when we did um, um, studies and assessment centers of managers, we take weeks. But nowadays, we do them instantly in short periods of time. They're not very good, but they're cheap. Okay, so this is the way it works. <laughs> You'll find this in a game show. You've got a choice between two games. Game A, toss a, a coin. Comes on heads, you win a cool 500,000. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Tails nets you a cool one million. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, game B, on the other hand, heads nets you a massive 20 million. Yeah. Tails gives you nothing. Okay, who's going for uh, game A? Who fancies game A? Okay, look at the crazy people who didn't go for game A. Okay, who's going for game B? Look at the crazy people who went for game A. Okay, what's happening is you've just described how you see the world. Whether you see the downside of the world or the upside of the world. Now, if you see the downside of the world, it means that often when you're going to situations, you're quite nervous. Now, what they taught us in terms of leadership, the conventional lead, uh, wisdom is, leaders must be motivational. No, leaders should do everything in their power to reduce the level of fear of the potential participants, friends, and followers. Why? Because how do you do motivation to somebody? Or they'll say, leaders must be inspirational. Look, what happens with inspiration in real life? is you see somebody doing something, it looks like fun, and you want to join in or copy. In other words, from the leader's point of view, it's because you're doing something which is difficult or impossible, but you seem to be enjoying it. Are you with me? Now, you can't force enjoyment if it's really bad. I'm supposed to be inspiring them, so I'm going to enjoy it. No, of course not. So, that whole mindset is wrong. We need to reduce the level of fear. And that's why I started at the beginning by saying to you, you're probably worried I'm going to say X, Y, Z, because it's crucial that you, I make sure that I understand where you're coming from so I can reassure you early. Then you'll pay attention. No one wakes up early in the morning to work really hard on something they think is going to fail. So that's the first one. The second thing I want to try and share with you, which is a classic mistake, again, we make with our thinking, is this process that somehow or other, by knowing what and how, we can go and communicate our vision clearly to people and make them excited. I'll tell you a story about myself. At one stage, when I was a student, I was in charge of the common room where all the, the, tea, the students went for tea. Now, I live in the UK, so we drink tea properly, you know, boiled from a kettle, not that hot water, horrible stuff. Okay, so I was, uh, I was busy looking at this one day, and the thing about kettles in, in those days was, effectively, you got a device which was, um, uh, have I lost it? Yeah, I think I've lost it. Uh, you got a device which was um, basically a silverish, um, uh, um, what best to describe it as, cylinder with a lid on it. And the lids would jam, basically. The, the lids would quite happily jam so that you got to a point where the lid could not come off and therefore you had to fill it up through the spout. And the only way you knew whether it was full or not was to lift it up and down. And I had this brilliant idea. You see, I was an engineering student, and we used to have these things that's called cylinders. And on the side of the cylinder, there'd be a glass rod like that. So when you fill the cylinder up, it, it would show you through the glass how full it was. So I said, it's called a side glass. I said, let's drill some holes in our kettle and stick a side glass in. Can you imagine how excited I was? Do you know what happened? <laughs> well, they didn't nickname me side glass, so that was good. But the amount of... Humor, which was made at my expense. Why was that that funny to everyone? The reason, quite simply, was I'd shared my vision and I'd shared my, my objective and it was mine. You have to understand, human beings are designed in a really peculiar way. Yeah? The only reason we're here is because, as human beings, we were able to survive being eaten by other animals. That means that, and I'm not a neurophysicist, so you can tell me, but apparently in the back of your neck about here, okay, there's a little bit of software, and that software runs all the time, basically telling you that anything which changes close to you is a potential threat, and then it fills you full of emotion, sometimes fear, sometimes laughter, and then once it's done that, it basically makes sure that your brain is switched off, the modern brain which does all the thinking, okay, the logic has to go off, okay, and then you can do your drug-filled fighting or fleeing. So what I'd done is I'd walked into this group and I'd announced my new vision. 
And of course, their brains had gone off. Their emotion had kicked in. You with me? And we do this all the time. No, no, it's about getting them to share the development of the vision. Because this will have happened to you. You have an idea. You can't go, go back from Ted. It's like your, your baby. You've fallen in love with this idea. It's brilliant. You, you're thinking, yeah, I, I want to take this baby, and I want it to solve the world's problem. You know, you, you know how you fall in love with your, with your ideas? You know how brilliant your ideas are? Have you noticed that? Okay, everyone else is rubbish. Yours are great. So you go and you tell your colleagues, this is a brilliant idea. Look at my baby. And you present your baby, and they look at it. And instead of saying, wonderful baby, they look at it and you say, what do you think, what do you think? And they go, oh, it's ugly. <laughs> and you go, no, 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 no. I, I've not explained it properly. And you start to use logic. But you see, you've forgotten they're in an emotional state. As you use logic, does it work? Try it one day. Next time your other half says, you don't really love me. Try and use logic to convince them that it works. <laughs> see what happens. You give them a hug. The only thing which will beat emotion is emotion. But in this meeting, you explain what's going on, why? And they all suddenly go, yes, 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 of course. And then they leave the meeting and go, no, it's an ugly baby, okay? <laughs> One person always stays behind. The one who stays behind says these magic words. You know, it's funny, I had a similar idea myself. Have you had this one? Can I work with you on this project? And you're so pleased because you think they like your baby, but you weren't listening. They said they like their baby. They just want some of your milk to feed their idea. Are you with me? <laughs> So it's important if you want to succeed in change that you bring people with you. You allow them to create the vision. You don't take your vision with great big views of yourself and impose them on everyone. You allow people to join in. And it's crucial that you do it in a humble way because they come up with stuff which is much better than what you thought of in the first place. So those are three bits. One, you have to recognize that the type of change we're dealing with is not rigid. And when it's flexible, you have to look backwards and forwards and plan and discuss and so on. The second one is really to make absolutely certain that as you're trying to drive through this change, you don't confuse yourself. And the last one is bring them with you. So if you can take those three thoughts away, I think I'll be quite pleased. Because this always happens with Ted. As I said, I have been here before. <laughs> so the time ticks on and the 18 minutes comes. And there's so much more to share. So I've enjoyed my journey over 20 years of trying to run a virtual business school. I've had to reinvent the business three times. It was almost killed by the dot-com, because before dot-com, I could charge for what I did. Then dot-com came along, and it was free. Are you with me? But I have to stop there, because I've been here before, and I've run out of time to tell you more stories. But if you do want to connect with me, if you do want us to share more stories, visit me, my virtual Qbot me, my Qbot avatar, at cube.cc, ask for an entry pass, and come to one of our events and uh, join in, and let's talk a bit more. I've thoroughly enjoyed working with you. Thank you very much. Thanks.